just as a quick recap, if you weren't here two weeks ago, um, maybe three weeks now that Christian Allen was here, he talked about this, this call, this prophetic word for our church. He called it crazy faith. Remember this? A couple of people? We're all like goldfish in here. We have 10 second memories. <laughs> crazy faith. And if you remember, he said, write it down, write it down, write it down. And um, we didn't know that our, our, actual, our recording, audio and video, failed that week. Yeah, and so he knew what he was talking about. Write it down. And so now I am repenting for not obeying <laughs> the word. I'm half joking. But he talked about crazy faith and this invitation that God has given us as a community and as individuals into the season of crazy faith. And then last week, James gave an amazing word just through story and testimony about crazy faith in his own life, but particularly at the end about resurrection power. You remember this? I hope so. Did you write it down? Well, that one we have recorded. Um, and he talked about God's desire to raise the dead at the end of service. Uh, I, I don't know if that one passes you by, but that requires an extraordinary amount of crazy faith to believe that God wants to raise the dead, but in particular, dead attributes and dead wallets and dead longings and on and on and on. If you were here, you remember, and if you weren't here, then you can go check it out online. I believe that today we're going to step into both of those words, bring them together and see what God is saying for our lives in this season around crazy faith and how that is tied to believing that God raised his son from the dead. Do you believe that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ali. Appreciate that. And so we're going to read a passage of scripture um, just off the top, Romans chapter 10. Then we're going to pray and then Sam can take his cue and go sit down. Romans chapter 10, and then we are going to spend some time in John chapter 11 today. So Romans chapter 10, and we're going to start, let's see, in verse 8. It says this, but what does it say? That is the word of God. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. In verse nine, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and, very important word, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that is the requirement by which you are saved. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you that you speak and you speak clearly. God, we give you our hearts in these next moments as we look to you, search you out in your word. Or would you do something in us that only you can do? Lord, that you would quicken our hearts to understand, to have depth of insight that only your Holy Spirit can give us. And we just say yes to the call to crazy faith in this season. And we respond to your invitation into it. So we just bless you, Jesus, right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, Sam, thank you so much. If you confess Jesus is Lord, how many people in this room have confessed that Jesus is Lord? How many people believe 
in their hearts. How many of you believe in your hearts and online that God raised him from the dead? Have you ever asked why Paul separates those two things? That you got to confess with your mouth that he is Lord, but you have to identify in your heart that it's true that he died for you, but not just died for you to cleanse you by his blood. He rose again by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's necessary to believe that that is true so that you can be saved. You must believe this. We're talking about crazy faith today. And that is crazy faith to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And so if you're wondering whether or not you have the capacity for crazy faith in how you interpreted Christian inviting us into, by God's word, into crazy faith, I'll tell you that if you believe that to be true, you have crazy faith. Can you just say, I have crazy faith? If you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, what more is the thing that you're asking him for in your life right now? Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? Amen. That is going to be significant as we move through the word of God today. See, faith is a word that just rolls off our tongue in this day and age, isn't it? Like faith, the word, is not exclusive to the church anymore. Like faith in our city, especially in our Western world, is whatever you want it to be, isn't it? Everywhere you go, you hear someone's version of faith, and you have to question today whether or not they're talking about the same faith that you have. So faith isn't what we think it is as Christians to people who are outside of this context. Faith is a word that has been apprehended. There's fraudulent versions of faith in this world. Have you heard of manifesting before? Ali's heard of it. Thank you for the double confirmation. <laughs> and it, it's defined this way, believing in something in order to see it come your way. Whoa, that's, that's maybe what we've considered faith to be. Manifesting is the ability to use the power of your mind to change and create the reality you experience. I recently heard a, a, a celebrity talked about the, the, the man that she's about to marry, and she said this, I've been manifesting him since I was three years old. Like, this is the, this is the guy that I've always wanted, and now here he is. I made this happen because I just believed that it was going to happen. Now, th this is not the faith that you and I talk about. The faith that you and I talk about is the one that Paul declares in Romans, that if you confess that Jesus is Lord and that you believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, when we talk about crazy faith, we are not, let me be clear, talking about manifesting our desires. We are talking about believing that he is who he says he is, and that he can do and he will do what he says he will do. Amen. And we are in Vancouver. Let's make this clear. Ali, you're my biggest cheerleader today. I love it. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, I've been considering this and how there is a, let's put it this way, come to Jesus type faith. Right? The moment that you believed, you came to Jesus, and it requires faith for that to happen. Like no man nor woman can come to that understanding or conclusion without the witness of the Holy Spirit and that requires faith. Did you see him come up out of that grave? No. But you know what happened because the Holy Spirit is witnessing to you. There's a come to Jesus type of faith. There's a faith that receives the word of God when it comes. But there's also a life in him type of faith. Like the faith required to walk out the journey that he's called you to in him. Have you considered this before? 
Paul says over and over and over in the book of Ephesians that we are now in him. We are in Christ, this new location that we have. It's not just in Vancouver and the realities that we see around us. We're actually in a greater and deeper reality, that being in Christ. But that reality is an unseen reality. It's a spiritual reality. So there's not just a faith that's required to come to him. There's a faith that's required for life in him. Like, how do you believe the things that he's saying and doing when everything around you looks other and opposite? It requires faith. And so, you and I need to understand and become experts in faith. If you're going to become experts in life on anything, let it be faith. The means by which we engage the unseen reality, the reality that we now have in him. And it begins here, believing that God can raise the dead. That's not a maturity in you faith that you come to. That's actually where it begins. That's the come to Jesus faith, but that's the also life in him faith that he can raise the dead and he's still raising the dead. You're gonna need that type of faith for life in him. It's a crazy type of faith because if God can do that, then can't he do this? Can't he do the thing that you're praying about? Can he not perform the word that he spoke to you? Can he not fulfill his promises that he gave you despite it looking like death? Can he not raise that thing? Oh, yes, he can. This is where it starts and this is where it's sustained. Whatever you're praying for, according to his will, is it harder than overcoming death? No. So if he can raise the dead and that's where it all begins, can he not then perform the thing that you think is impossible in your life. Oh, yes, he can. And yes, it is good. Thank you, God, for your word. And so we are going to look today at this story in John chapter 11. It's going to be our backdrop. And it's the story of how Jesus raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. And this is not mythology. This is an account, a true account of what happened a couple thousand years ago. There's witnesses all over this story. And it's testified over and over and over again. This is history, but it's God's word. So John chapter 11, we have this story of Jesus who gets word that his friend Lazarus is sick. And then Jesus says, don't worry, this will not end in death. His friend's far away, and Jesus is like, calm down, everybody. It's not going to end in death. So everybody that heard this news is like, okay, cool. Jesus, he's got it. He's sick, but it's going to be okay. And then Jesus says, let's go be with him. He's sleeping. I got to go wake him up. And his disciples are like, no, 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 don't wake him up. Sleep is good for him. Just let him sleep this thing off. And then Jesus looks them square in the face and says this, no, you don't get it. He's dead. Jesus says, this will not end in death. And then Jesus also says, he's dead. Okay, what's going on here? And so Jesus says, it's it's time to go. And his disciples are like, no, don't go because they hate you over there. They're gonna stone you. They're gonna kill you. Jesus responds and says, no, it's not my time yet. So he goes boldly into the place that his friends are telling him not to go. And then when he gets there, uh, Lazarus' sister, Martha, comes running up to him. And Jesus and Martha have this exchange of like, if you were only here, this wouldn't have happened. And then Jesus starts talking about resurrection. Don't you believe in resurrection? And she says, yes, I believe in resurrection. And, and then Jesus is, is saying, I am the resurrection. I'm here. It's not just something that happens later. It's something that happens right now. And then he meets Martha's sister, Mary, and then has an exchange with Mary, and then, 
And then he goes and he weeps with this family because their, his friend, their brother, has died. They're mourning over him. And then he stands at his tomb and says, open the tomb, let him out. And Lazarus raises from the dead. He says, take off his grave clothes. And we have this miracle of Jesus declaring, not just with his lips, but with his life, that he is resurrection itself. Story of Lazarus. It was my best Sunday school summary of John chapter 11. And we're going to have a look at some of these verses today and, and step with them into the story and how dramatic this would have been for them and their experiences of confronting circumstances that seem to defy exactly what God said and how God is inviting us in Jesus to believe on the things that he said despite what the circumstances look like. Can we go there together? I just gave you all my points ahead of time, and we're going to engage together. I'm going to teach this morning, but I really believe that the Lord is going to do uh, some incredible things in our lives. Would you agree? Yeah. All right. So in this story, we see a series of reactions from Martha, from the disciples, from Mary, from Jesus even, that expose the state of our hearts as we encounter life and all its circumstances. So verse 4, John chapter 11, when Jesus heard this, heard the news that Lazarus, his friend, was sick, he said this, this sickness will not end in death. Now, this is a significant statement. Why? Because it is the word of God. It's the rhema word of God. When Jesus says something to you, it is the literal word of God. Jesus, the son of God, God made flesh, declares that this will not end in death. Those of us in this room who have received the word of God have words like this in our lives. This circumstance that you are walking through, this dream that you have, this situation that's in front of you will not end in death. In other words, it will live to see the life that I declared when I gave you the word. This will not end in death. They have the rhema word of God. They have the promise of God. And when you get the word of God, hold on to it with everything that you are and everything that you have. Because when Jesus says something, when he gives you a promise, he will perform it. Oh, when you have his word, do not for a second loosen your grip on it. They have the word of God. This will not end in death. And then Lazarus dies. Like, what is going on here? God, what about what you just said? Anybody asked this question before? Like when you move forward on God's word and it didn't look anything like you thought it should? Like you built your life according to his purpose and his promise? You believed in what it said here? You got married? God blessed it? And now what is our circumstance? What are we walking through now? God, did you not say that this was blessed? And why am I walking through a situation that looks more like a curse than a blessing? Anybody been here before? Or you started a business based on the promise of God, and it looks like that thing is not looking anything like the promise of God. My life isn't looking anything like I thought it should or what I thought God said, or what I see in this word. God, don't you know the trouble and the struggles that I have gone through, that I'm going through? Are you kidding me? You said that this was going to happen. I leveraged my entire life on your word, and this is what I have. Am I being a little too attitude-y this morning? You're in this room, you're at church this morning, so you're feeling decent about the word of God. Matthew 13, Jesus describes his word, a seed that falls to different soils. 
one being a path that the word of God cannot penetrate, another one being rocky ground, another one being thorns, another one being ground that is healthy. But of the rocky ground, Matthew 13, verse 20, it says this, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Thank you for your promise, God. I'm moving forward with what you've just said. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes, listen, because of the word, not despite the word, because of the word, they quickly fall away. Meaning, God, you gave me this promise. I move forward with your promise, and now look what it's costing me. I decided to move forward in integrity in my finances, and I had to give up that opportunity and this opportunity, and now what do I have, God? It could have been way better over there. I move forward trying to honor you and your word, and everybody else seems to be advancing beyond me. Their marriage is great. Mine isn't so good right now. And I did everything according to what you said. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word. See, there's a faith to receive the word, but there's also a faith to nurture the word of God. That in receiving the word, it, it costs me some faith. But I'm here to tell you, and Jesus is too, that it's actually going to cost you some faith to nurture that word. And those who do not have the energy or the faith to nurture that word, Jesus says, they quickly fall away because they feel like they've been fooled. They feel like they leveraged their life on a lie, something that did not have the power to sustain it. I made that decision on God's word, and now look what it's costing me. Look where I'm at. And you stop nurturing, we stop nurturing God's word and his promises because it's costing you too much. It's causing you to give up too much. More than you expected. Or more particularly, different than you expected. So Jesus said, now this won't end in death. And then he's dead. See, my problem in this story isn't that he's dead. Death happens. We know. Things happen, don't they? Stuff happens. My problem in this story is that he said it wouldn't happen. God, you said that life was supposed to be like this, and it looks different. Is anybody with me there? Like, I get struggles. You don't have to look very far to know that this world is in pain and it's broken, but God, when you say something other than what I'm walking through right now, that's the confusing thing to me. Because if I can't bank on your word, I might as well go bank on my own. I might as well go figure things out in the way that I think best in my life. If I don't have your word, what do I have? How can I trust you, God, when you said this would not end in death and then he dies? But if you read this story carefully, Jesus never said that he wouldn't die. He said it wouldn't end in death, but he did not say death would not be part of the process. So Jesus will always fulfill his word. He just might take a different path than we expected. Do we have a paradigm for that level of faith? When the word of God comes, the promise of God comes, you say yes to it, you receive it, you start nurturing it, and then it starts to look very different than you thought it would when you first received it. Do you have faith to grab hold of, to continue to nurture and protect the word of God in your life? Because Jesus says those who don't will quickly fall away. And what happens in falling away? You actually never get to see what happens on the other side of the faith that you once had at the beginning. Remember, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he's master, that he's captain, that my life is his, and that you believe that God can raise the dead, starting with Jesus, you will be saved. It is the foundation of our faith 
to believe that God can raise things from the dead. I believe that this has caused a lot of pain and disappointment in the church. Do you have any friends, family, that have walked away from the promises of God because of disappointment like this? Something like a global pandemic shake up our understanding or our thought about how good God is or what he's doing? Oh, it shook. It shook. It made us ask questions like, God, didn't you say? Didn't you want? Didn't you promise? And now here I am? Well, maybe if it's not what I thought it was, then I should give up on the whole thing altogether. This caused a lot of people to be disappointed. I've been disappointed at times. But here's the thing, we're banking our lives on things other than he said. Thinking it's what he said. As his people, his followers, we have to go back to what he actually said. What his promises are, not what traditions said before us or the language that we've adopted from our parents or the churchianity culture that we've subscribed to, we actually got to go and find out what Jesus himself is saying. Not what we think he's saying. Because if we bank our lives on what we think he's saying, not what he's actually saying, it's a recipe for disaster. It's a big disappointment waiting to happen. Because guess what? He is only obliged to fulfill his own word. That's why if you get his word, hang on to it for everything because he will perform it. How are you guys doing this morning? Should we shake it out? There's a few yawns. Coffee, Ben, come on. Can we get some table of service in here today? Thank you for coffee. This is the word of God and it's going to transform our hearts. So they send message to Jesus, your friend is sick. And Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick, of course, and they all heard that Lazarus was sick. It wasn't just news that was exclusive to Jesus, they all heard it. And it says that they stayed where they were for two more days after hearing that he was sick. Son of God, power to heal, power to raise the dead, they stay there for two more days. Like Jesus was making sure that he was dead, dead that he was more than dead. Have you ever been in a place where you cry out for help? Say, God, I'm sick, I need you, and then he waits. And he, and he gets sicker, and things get worse, the financial situation gets worse than when you cried out. Well, that's what Jesus did here. He heard the need and he, and he said, oh, we're gonna wait. Okay, God. What are you inviting us into? And then Jesus declares in this story, okay, now it's time to go. In his sovereignty, in his understanding, in his wisdom, in his knowing what the Father is doing, he says, now it's time to go. And his boys were like, why are we going? Let them sleep. It's not time to go. In fact, if you go, like you're going to get killed. In verse 11, we read this. It says this. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Verse 12, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. And Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And listen, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there. It's for your sake that I didn't answer the prayer the way you wanted, when you wanted, how you wanted. So that you may believe, but now let us go to him. Lazarus is dead, and guess what, friends? It's for your sake that he's dead. This is Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Jesus, he's dead. It's a good thing for you that he's dead. Jesus doesn't come through how you want him to come through in your finances, your marriage, your circumstances, your business. And guess what he says at times in his sovereignty? It's for your sake. What? 
Have we considered Jesus this way before? Or why didn't Jesus just let them continue to believe that, that he was sleeping? Like, kept them from the heartache. If they believed that he was sleeping, okay, boys, you just continue to believe that he's sleeping, and he's okay, that he's going to be better. You stay here. I'll go wake him up, but just, you're good. You don't need to step into this heartbreak. He says, no, boys, he's dead. And I need you to know how dead he is. He told them plainly. He made them face how horrible their circumstance was. He didn't keep them how, from how horrible it was. Like, just don't acknowledge how bad things are right now. If you just turn the blind eye from how difficult things are, you're going to be okay. And Jesus takes their faces and says, no, I want you to see how jacked up things are right now. That sounds like torture, doesn't it? But Jesus, in his love and in his kindness, says, son, daughter, it is for your sake. Shall we keep going? Thank God we can keep going after that one. Romans chapter 4, about Abraham, Paul says this, against all hope. Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. He had a promise from God, and against all hope he hoped. It says in verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb, his wife, was also dead. It says that he faced the fact. He did not move forward in ignorance. He knew how horrible his circumstance was. And then verse 20, it says this, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being, listen, fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. So you have here in both these stories, Lazarus and in Abraham, God's word, God's promise in direct contrast and, and conflicting, in confliction with the circumstances that defy his word. Hear me, black and white contrast, his word, and then every circumstance that lives to defy his word. This is the context that we're entering into this morning. See, many of us, through a misunderstanding of faith, try not to acknowledge how bad things really are. He's just sleeping. Let him keep sleeping. He'll get better. Just let it be. It'll work itself out. I don't want to deal how hard with how hard this is. So I'll just cross my fingers and hope that when I look at it again, it's going to be okay. Now, some might define that as faith, but that's not the faith that Jesus is inviting us to in this story. We need to know that he can raise people from the dead. Don't acknowledge how bad it is. It's a, it's a form of self-preservation, self-protection. But acknowledging harsh realities does not undermine your faith. It actually empowers it. I had a friend who was dying of terminal cancer, stage four. And praise God, he lived for years in stage four cancer. But his son, so full of faith, God bless his heart, refused to acknowledge that his dad had cancer. So the family could not talk about it around him. They would not talk about it around him because they didn't want to enter that space because he couldn't handle that space in his faith. But he actually, in his mind and in his spirit, thought that that was faith. 
Don't acknowledge how bad it is. Don't declare how bad it is. Don't align yourself with how bad it is. And Jesus is telling them, no, you need to face the fact that this is as good as dead. In fact, in the story of Lazarus, Jesus could have in his timing prevented it from getting there. And he said, no, I'm going to let it get worse than you think. Acknowledging harsh realities does not undermine your faith. It actually empowers it. It might actually be exactly what you need. It says that Abraham was strengthened in his faith. Why? Why could Abraham be strengthened in his faith when his body was as good as dead and the promise of God was that he would have a son and that son would become a nation? Because if it's dead, it cannot be revived in your own strength. Let me say it again. If it's dead, it cannot be revived in your own strength. That is good news. And if it's God's word, it cannot be sustained in your own strength. And when God said, hear me, that this will not end in death, there is only one source of faith, of strength, of will that, that can sustain his word. When God said, this will not end in death, there's only one person that can fulfill that promise. You can't do it. Your mom can't do it. The president can't do it. The prime minister can't do it. Circumstances won't do it. Doctors can't do it. Only Jesus can do it. This is crazy faith. See, faith engages the greater reality that we have in Christ. The reality that we have in Vancouver might look gloomy. There might be a circumstance in front of you in this reality that looks like death or its equivalent. But the reality that we have in Christ is a different reality. It's a greater reality. It's one that we've been invited to. And when we have no means to make things happen in our own strength, yet God said, this is good news. Because we only have one place to look, and it's in him. Jesus says, it's for your sake that I wasn't there, that you weren't there. Why? So that you may believe. He's telling them that you're about to encounter something that will shift your focus from this earthly reality and its circumstances to a heavenly reality and its circumstances. Does anybody need a shift from what we see around us to a greater reality in Christ? Yes. Oh, I know that I do. Have we been confronted in the last two years about how we've been holding on to this reality that we've gone accustomed to and used to? And when it starts getting rattled and shaken, we don't know where else to look except for the thing that we've held on to for so long, which is our security and our strength and our perception. And God's saying, listen, did I not give you a word? And if I give you a word, there's only one place you can look for the fulfillment of that word. It isn't when the government does what you want them to do. It isn't when your spouse starts acting the way that you want them to act. It isn't when you get the medication that you think you need for this thing. No, it's when he performs his word. That's the reality that we have now in Christ. It's not something we grow into. It's actually something we begin with. Believing that God can raise and did raise Jesus from the dead. So Thomas, Thomas hears this word. One of Jesus' disciples, verse 16. Thomas hears this word. And he says to the rest of the disciples, he says, let us go so that we might die with him. This is when Jesus says, let's go. And they think that Jesus is going to die. And so Thomas is like, let's go, all of us, so that we might die with him. I want this guy on my team. I'm about to head out to war. And he's like, oh, you're not going to survive. You're actually going to die. But I'm going to go with you anyways. 
I want this guy on my team. See, Thomas, he gave his life. He was willing to give his life anyways for Jesus, but he only had a paradigm for death. He didn't have a paradigm for what God would do on the other side of death. And many of us are that way as we sign up to follow Jesus, like we're going to war and we're never going to come back. Like I'm going down with the ship. He only had a paradigm for death. And many of us, it just looks like this, this like we're despising the world that's around us. I mean, it's all going downhill, so there's no point in trying anymore. We're just going to cast off all restraint. It's all going to die. I had this guy that I was talking to a few weeks ago, and he's like, man, I love your preaching. I love what God is doing in your church. I want to be around it, but there's only one thing I disagree with. I think the world's going to end in six years. <laughs> so there's no point preaching about hope. <laughs> there's no point preaching about the next generation. There's no point preaching about what God wants to do next. Oh, I'm like, I get it. You've only got a paradigm for death. It's all going downhill. Thank God the word says in Peter that Jesus delays his return so that more might be saved. It's good that I haven't come yet so that you might believe, he says about Lazarus. Let's let our heart be checked about our paradigms here. Is God not the great redeemer? Oh, he takes jacked up circumstances and he lets them be jacked up so that he can come show himself as redeemer. But if we don't see or have hope that there's something on the other side of the jacked up situation, we'll never see him as redeemer. Oh, but he has my hope as the great redeemer. Does he have yours? But more of us, let me say this, more of us only have a paradigm for life. Martha, Jesus', Jesus friend, Lazarus' sister, said this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So I struggle here. I don't know about you. What am I missing, God? Why is this happening? Did I disobey your word? Did I not have enough faith and that's why I'm going through what I'm going through right now? Did I do something wrong? Verse 37, others of them said this, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? God, did, could you not have kept me from that pain or that suffering or that embarrassment or that failure? God, why are you letting me go through this? Last week, James, in such anointed preaching, talked about God resurrecting wallets and and, and, and attributes and, and longings from the dead. And I'm the guy in the room asking this, why were they dead in the first place? Like God is resurrection, we know that. I've seen that in this story already. But my question is, God, why did you let them get there in the first place? Now God, Jesus particularly, is a rabbi, he's a teacher, right? So he teaches us when we do things out of accordance with his will and his purpose, He'll, he'll teach us through hardship. He will. But there's things that are unavoidable in our lives. Or we move forward in them with the best intentions and they go awry according to what we thought would happen. And my heart goes, God, why did you let this happen? Can anybody relate? And in this, we're, 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 we're so set on the fact that Jesus only wants what we describe and have paradigm for as good things in our lives. God, how, how did you let Lazarus die and willingly let him die? I don't know if you ask these questions or not. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I'm opening up a can of worms in your heart right now that you didn't want to open this morning. But this is the word of God. Why didn't you keep this from happening, God? We have to meet Jesus here. In this question, we have to meet Jesus because it's in these questions that Jesus wants to reveal himself. Not just give you the answers that you want, but give you the person that you're truly looking for, which is himself. 
Jesus, uh, Martha says this, if you had been here, verse 21, my brother would not have died. And then she turns a little bit, verse 22, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. She's starting to engage her faith in this moment. And then Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he'll rise again, like rolling her eyes. I know he'll rise again, Jesus, in the resurrection on the last day. Like she thought that Jesus was talking in cliches. Like we wrap our arms around each other. Don't worry, it's going to be better. It's going to be okay. God is good and he's going to come through. But there's no substance to what we're saying because it's just what we've learned and what we've been taught. Like Martha here had good theology. She understood that in the last day, the resurrection is going to happen. And then Jesus confronts her in this moment. And we have the great climax of this story. Long before Lazarus is raised from the dead, Jesus declares this to her. I am the resurrection and the life. Yeah, I know, Jesus, you're good out there. I know, the, I know I'm going to be in heaven one day. And Jesus says, hey, listen, I didn't die to get you into heaven. I died so that I can get into you right now. I am the resurrection and the life. Everything you believe about who God is isn't reserved for the future. It's standing in front of you right now. And it takes circumstances like this for Jesus to walk us into so that he can reveal himself to us in a way that we need. Praise God for this. See, good theology isn't about getting the right answers on the test or knowing the definitions of long, complicated terms. It's about encountering Jesus as he reveals himself. That is good theology. Bill Johnson said it this way, that Jesus himself is perfect theology. Martha was saying, yeah, yeah, I know that resurrection is going to happen one day, but that doesn't help me now. And Jesus says, everything that you believe about one day is standing in front of you now. See, God is letting us walk through situations that seem like they're as good as dead and counter to his word so that he can reveal himself to us in them. Amen. Amen. I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't just want to heal. He wants to reveal himself as the healer. Don't just look for what you want him to do. Look for him. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. You need direction in your life? Don't ask for direction. Follow him. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am provider. I am protector. I am sustainer. I am healer. This Bible, this entire journey is about God revealing himself to us in Jesus. Now we want things from him to fit our desires, but God's intention is to show us himself. And in himself is everything we need. Oh. <laughs> I know it's a tired morning this morning, but Jesus is preaching and I know it. I'm just standing in his shoes this morning. This is his word. And Jesus says, if things are as good as dead, he doesn't say, I can raise the dead. He says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And he says, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Oh, there's so much here. He's not just talking about resurrection after you die. He's talking about how if you don't know Jesus and don't believe in him, you are dead. But the moment you believe in him, you have new life in him. You're born again. But he says this, 
Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? He's not asking them for a debate. He's not asking him for mental assent. He's asking if he believes. He's bypassing all the things, all the walls, all the barriers, all the circumstances, and he's going straight to the heart. He's saying, this is what matters most. Do you believe? That is his question for us this morning. Do you believe? Yes. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let me say it again. That's not just the come to Jesus faith. That's the life in Jesus faith. It's what we need now. And then... Sam, you can come back. Jesus says this. Some of the most profound words in all of Scripture. I told you so. <laughs> then Jesus said, did I not tell you? Did I not say? Did I not give you? Here, I'm going to speak to your hearts this morning. Did I not say to you? Did I not tell you? Did I not give you that promise? Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Did God give you a word? Did he not say to you? Did he not send you forward with purpose? Did I not say that if you believe, then you will see the glory of God? in your marriage, in your home, in your future, in your finances, in your relationships, in your mental well-being? What are the promises that he's given you? What does his word say about his desires for you and your future? Did I not tell you that if you just believe, you will see the glory of God. Jesus says, John 15, verse 7, if you remain in me and my word remains in you, abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What Jesus is saying, if you remain in me and when your reality, your existence, your life and its circumstances are shaped by my words, whatever you ask in my name will be done. This is the word of God. The power of his words. Crazy faith. When your reality, when your heart, when your life, when your mind, when the way you think is shaped by his word, the logos or the rhema, the prophetic word of God that you know came straight from his heart, when your reality is shaped by that word, ask whatever you wish. In my name, according to my word, my purpose, and my father will do it for you. That's the confidence that he has in his word that his father will hear him and perform it. But it requires that our realities, our inner realities are shaped by his word. Thank you, Ali. God bless you, my bro. You love him, you love his word. See, this is the thing about crazy faith. It shapes you long before it shapes anything around you. It changes your heart before it changes any of your circumstances. It changes the attitude of your heart. And from there, the circumstances that you're in. If you believe that God's going to heal your marriage, start acting like it. Let his word abide in you. Let his word start shaping you. 
Let his word keep you from things. And let his word send you into others. If you believe God's going to shape your finances and bless you there, start acting like it. Let the faith that you have shape your heart. If you believe that God is going to restore relationships, start acting like it. Solomon said, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I allow the entirety of my life to be shaped by your word. I'm only standing here today because I have protected with everything I am the words that God has spoken over my life. It's for no other reason than that. That if he said it and I believe it, he will perform it. Does anybody have a promise from God in their lives? No, I want to see hands. Do you believe? Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? You will see the glory of God. Scripture says, show me your faith by your actions. Start acting like you believe it. Speak God's word. Proclaim his truth. Remind yourself of everything he's saying. Let it keep you. Let it guard you. Let it sustain you. Oh, his word is everything. Speak it over yourself. Speak it over your marriage. Speak it over your future. Speak it over your circumstances. Cra this is crazy faith. Speak it over your government. Speak it over your boss. Pray for the prosperity of the land. Do you believe you will see the glory of God? And stop speaking other than the promises of God. Stop talking about divorce. Stop talking about how horrible things are. Face the fact and then start talking about his word, his promises, his goodness, his circumstances. You know why Ali is so happy this morning? Because he just got a job. That might not mean a lot to you and I, but Ali is a refugee who just got his status and God supernaturally gave him a job. That's why he's praising God. That's why he believes in his word. It's bubbling up over him. Praise the Lord indeed. Oh man, oh my soul. Yeah, come on, just... Ali is from Iran. Ali could not practice his Christianity without the threat of persecution, abuse, even death in Iran. Came over here. He has something to praise God about. Why? Because he's seen the glory of God. And you know what the glory of God looks like in his life? A part-time job at the Bay. Oh, I mean it. And you know how happy it is? He is? And I know what's next on his list, a girlfriend. <laughs> Did I not? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bro, you're preaching louder than me this morning, and I mean it. What did God say? What is he doing? What can we believe him for? And allow your world to be shaped by his word, and it's going to change everything. What's more important, our sensibilities or God's glory? Well, that's a tough question. Because what if the path to God's glory offends your sensibilities? But Jesus says this, it's for your sake, meaning this. 
God's glory is always for your benefit. Always. Experiencing God's glory is way better than experiencing any version of your life that you think is great. As we close this morning, I know I preached for a long time. I want everybody to hear this morning that Jesus is not that disconnected friend who just puts his arm on your shoulder and says it's going to be okay, aloof from the pain and the, and, the, and the circumstances and the heartache that you're in. Oh, he's not. Verse 33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He said, where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Verse 35, the shortest verse in the entire scripture. Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus is not, hear me, disconnected from the pain that you're walking through right now. He weeps and he cries with you as you cry. He hurts as you hurt in the circumstances that you're walking through. And he feels deeply with you, deeply with you. Sometimes, though, we're invited to go to the place with Jesus where all we have left is tears. He brings us to the end of ourselves, to the bitterness and the anger and fade away, disappointment, confusion, and all you have left is tears. You know what Jesus does? He sits there and he cries with you. He's so close to you. He loves you so much. Jesus can be this present in your pain and simultaneously invites you into a greater reality. No friend can do that. Only Jesus can do that. He is present with us in our pain, but at the same time, he invites us to somewhere that really he only has eyes for. He makes them face their pain. He is present with them in it meaning that it's his pain too. All so they can see him for who he is and they can experience God's glory. This is why as you follow Jesus, you're walking through what you're walking through so that you can see him for who he is and you can experience God's glory. And just as we close this morning, and allow the Holy Spirit to prompt in us what he's doing. I remember this time when I was 23, 24 years old and I worked as a behavioral therapist and I went and as part of my job, I went to the movies and I saw this classic film called The Last Song. Miley Cyrus, anybody? <laughs> this is more Hannah Montana than Miley Cyrus. The last song, epic movie. And in the movie <laughs> was this narrative, this plot of the, the dad, Greg Kinnear. Greg Kinnear is an amazing actor. I was going to say I wanted to be my dad, but that would be a little disrespectful to my own dad. Greg Kinnear. Greg Kinnear is dying of cancer. And there's this little brother, Miley Cyrus' little brother, who's whose like, heart is breaking because he's going to lose his dad. About to cry right now. And I remember leaving the movie theater just weeping and weeping. I'm so ashamed. Miley Cyrus movie. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, like snot and 
And I got a guy that I'm working with to my right in the car, and I'm weeping, and I'm weeping, and weeping. Because this little boy is about to lose his dad and he's wrestling with the reality of not having his dad. And I just felt the Lord, like Jesus was in the car with me and he was saying this to me, don't you feel like you've lost your dad too? Don't you feel like you've grown up? Don't you feel like that little boy who's been robbed of a relationship with his own father? My dad is alive. But I remember Jesus just sitting there with me in that car, inviting me into a space that I didn't even know existed in my heart. I just felt like he cried with me. And I'm telling you this vulnerable story because I felt a deep sorrow and sadness in that moment, but also a deep and simultaneous healing. And also in that moment, I then caught vision for my own future. See, Jesus doesn't open up a can of worms in our life and say, look how horrible the circumstances are and lets you sit there in that space. No, he joins you in that space. He cries with you in that space. And then he invites you to hang on to his word because he says in this space and through this space, you will experience the glory of God. And now to this day, I stand in front of you, a father of three kids. Three kids that I love with everything that I am. And I know that moment on the back end of a Miley Cyrus movie, Jesus met me in my car, took me to my pain, healed me out, sent me out, I should say, on the other side with vision for the man and the father that he's called me to be. Did I not say that you would experience the glory of God? What are the promises of God over your life this morning? And do you believe that you will see the glory of God through them? So as we close, the worship team is here. I want to ask you this question this morning. What are the spaces in your life? What are the circumstances that you're in? Maybe you haven't looked at them in a while, but you're prompted to this morning to have a look again. What are the spaces in your life that seem like they're in defiance to the word of God, to the promises of God? to the dreams that he has placed in your heart. Maybe you were in a church service one day and a preacher like me declared healing over anxiety, over depression. And on that day, you felt like that was a word from the Lord. I'm telling you right now, that's how the Holy Spirit speaks. And you left a church service and you believed with everything that you are that God was gonna set you free from the chains that enslaved you. That was the word of God. Do you believe? that he will perform every word that he speaks. And if it seems like it's taking a different path, do you trust that God will do exactly what he said? What word is God recovering in you this morning? it's over business, over finances, over opportunities, over your marriage, over your health. God is inviting us into crazy faith.
this morning as we respond. If you've grabbed hold of that word, that promise, maybe as many, and you've acknowledged that it isn't where it should be and it doesn't look the way I thought it would, but I still believe that because he said it, he will perform it. And there's a declaration of our faith this morning. If that's you, I just want you to stand up to your feet in this morning. have promises of home ownership in this city how many of us feel that God is going to do it how many of us have promises that we will be part of and experience a move of God that will reshape this city will he not do it How many of us believe that God has said he will heal people as we pray for them? Won't he do it? How many believe that God has declared over this city that we will see chains broken on East Hastings? Won't he do it? How many believe that we're going to see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people come to saving knowledge of Jesus in this city? Won't he do it? How many of us are believing that God is sending a spouse our way? Won't, won't he do it? Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? And if he can do that, can't he do this? believe that can you just lift your hands in the air Jesus we take you at your word this morning we are a people who have set our lives apart to believe in every word that you have spoken we reclaim and we recover right now in this moment everything that you have declared over our lives, our marriages, our minds, our hearts, our future, our bodies, Lord God. We will allow your word to shape our lives. We will speak your word, Jesus. Just declare his promises right now, whatever they are. Speak them out. Declare his promises. Come on, lift your voice. Be bold. Did I not say? Did I not say? Did I not say your child would come back to the Lord? Did I not say there will be reconciliation in your family? Did I not say your daughter would be free from addiction? Did I not say, will I not perform my word? This is called faith. 